morning, Calvary Chapel South Bay. I'm excited to be with you guys tonight as we get to finish together Joshua. Joshua's journal is coming to a close, and so we're going to be in Joshua chapter 24. As well, you want to turn your finger over to Ezekiel chapter 14. So Joshua chapter 24, Ezekiel chapter 14. If you've never heard of Ezekiel, find Isaiah and just keep going to the right. You'll get to him eventually. Ezekiel chapter 14. I'm excited about all that's going on, but uh, most especially just returned from Colombia and had an opportunity to be with our missionaries there serving the Lord in Cartagena as well as Tierra Bomba. And it's been amazing to me, the island of Tierra Bomba, where I went there 10 years ago because of the child sex trade, um, to be able to free those kids from getting involved with such a heinous crime. Um, the island was nothing but a disaster. And now that the gospel has entered onto the island 10 years later, they're seeing development and real community transformation. There's nothing like the power of the gospel. Our missionaries are doing well. They want to thank you, uh, Pastor Santiago, Pastor Tim, Pastor Alex. Maybe you don't recognize these names, but they know and love you and want you to know how grateful they are for your generous giving because the gospel is being preached in Cartagena, and let me affirm that it is, and going all around Colombia because of your faithfulness. So God bless you guys. God bless you. I want to let you know as well that um, we are going to be having a little family dinner in August. In fact, we're going to be doing it once a month. And once a month, we're going to be hosting a dinner on Thursday, so you can come straight from work here, have dinner with us, be it a food truck or our own hot dogs and hamburgers. Trust me, you will enjoy our hot dogs and hamburgers. If you didn't come to the baptism, next time just come for the hot dogs. Trust me. Okay, we have some faithful saints and servants that uh, are going to be feeding us once a month and we'll have a family dinner together. So I'm looking forward to being with you guys uh, for that as well. Joshua 24, Ezekiel chapter 14. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and prepare our hearts for his word. Lord, I am so thankful that we've come to a close, not because we're ending the book of Joshua, but because of all you've spoken to us through Joshua's journal. And I pray that as we now discover some real good final truths, his final sermon, that you would speak to us from your word, set us free from hidden things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This is a great time of year to go online and listen to graduation commencement speeches. I love them. And oftentimes, I'll go and listen, even listen to some from yesteryear. In fact, you'll find in these speaking engagements that they will offer a word of encouragement, and they'll offer a word of warning or a word of exhortation. In fact, it was only a few years ago that George Bush, the former president, he went to his alma mater, Southern Methodist University, and he spoke directly to students with a C average because he was a C average student, and he said to them, you too with a C average can be a president. Now, maybe you think he was a C average president, but that is not for us to discuss tonight. But he spoke to encourage them and said, if you think you are too small to be effective, you have never been in bed with the mosquito. And I thought that was such a profound statement because when I was in Liberia, the mosquitoes knew my name. Che. They would bother me all night long. In fact, I'll never forget, there was a missionary that came to visit us, and because of a mosquito, he came running, barging into our room at 3 a.m. And he said to me, from New, he was from New York, he said, Pastor Chet, I promise you there's a mosquito as big as a flamingo in my, in my room, and it's going to take up my leg, and it's going to take it to its friends outside, and they're going to suck it dry. I'm telling you, these mosquitoes in Africa. 
Forget about it. I eat. You'll never know how effective you can be. Just look to a, mos a, a mosquito in your bedroom. But then there was another one that I listened to. This one a little bit more exhortative, not encouraging. Sheryl Sandberg, maybe you don't know her, she was the COO of Facebook at the time. And her husband, Dave Sandberg, had just died. If you know Monkey Survey, he invented it. And he said this. Dave, she said, Dave's death changed me in very profound ways. I learned about the depths of sadness and the brutality of loss. But I also learned that when life sucks you under, you can kick against the bottom, find the surface, find the surface and breathe again. And she spoke to the students there at UC Berkeley about building resistance and celebrating each and every moment because time is not guaranteed, it's a gift. What a word of exhortation. They're speaking these words because it's the end of one season and the beginning of another. We're experiencing that at Calvary Chapel South Bay. It's the end of Pastor Jeff's season and it's the beginning of my season. And I'm finding that Pastor Jeff, like Joshua, is pouring into my life. He and I talk every day, almost every day, at least five days a week. We talk about life. We talk about the church. We talk about you. We've cried with you and over you and for you. We've cried because of you. I'm kidding. We love you. And Pastor Jeff, amen, Pastor Jeff is pouring into my life. And that's exactly what's happening in Joshua chapter 24. It's the end of Joshua's ministry, and it's the beginning of even a new style of ministry. You see, Joshua replaced Moses by direction of God, but there is no new leader that God establishes. He's going to establish a multifaceted group of leaders because God wants to be the leader of the nation of Israel. Joshua's 110 years old. I'm thankful to report Pastor Jeff is not that old. And Joshua's been in ministry for about 60 years. His ministry is coming to a close. And we're about 20 years from Joshua chapter 22. And so Joshua 23 and 24 are at the end of Joshua's life. We're about 20 years, which gives Joshua time to watch the children of Israel living in peace and prosperity in the promised land. And the one thing about time is it allows you to see a person's testimony. For 20 years, he's been watching. And so he, like a good pastor, after watching his flock, wants to encourage them, and he wants to exhort them. They've heard this message before that he's going to deliver oh, from no other than Moses. You can read it later in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10. Moses gives the same word of encouragement. Moses will give the same word of exhortation. And like following the leader, Joshua is going to reinforce all that Moses has already said. And if something's got to be repeated in our life, then maybe God's trying to get our attention. And in the midst of their peace and prosperity, Joshua wants to speak a message of faithfulness. Because in the midst of peace and prosperity, I don't know about you, but there's a tendency to take it easy. There's a tendency to allow comfort and convenience to become something so much that you enjoy that you forget the words of Jesus. Now listen, this is one that you want to put up on a plaque in your room. It's Matthew 7.14. Narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way. Can't you just see your Thomas Kincaid picture wrapping around this? Narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. I'm going to tell you why. We've got three enemies fighting against us. 
we have our flesh. And do you know that your flesh and my flesh, we love the easy road? We love hopping in the raft and just going down the stream of life as it floats us around the hotel. You know that special little lagoon that you can just get inside your raft and it just floats you around. In the Bahamas, it's at Sandals Resort, okay? Want to encourage you to go there and you could just go round and round. But let me tell you something. If you've got to swim against that stream, it's going to take some effort. You see, our flesh loves to just sit in the raft and let the world take over. But then we've got the world to deal with. Let me tell you what the world will lure us into. The world will lure us into materialism. Keeping up with the Joneses. Well, they just got a new F-150. I need a new F-150. And let me tell you something. Don't go for the F-150. Go for the Toyota Tacoma. (laughs) Or the Tundra. Or the F-250, the King Lariat. I mean, I could go on and on. I mean, if iPhone 45 comes out, I've got to have it. A friend of mine in Columbia, they have an iPhone 6. And she was shaking it for it to work. And I said, that's a problem. Do you know we're up to 11? Her response was, well, I'm not into materialistic things. I quickly put my iPhone 11 back in my pocket. We also have the enemy. So we have our flesh, we have the world, we have the enemy who tempts us to doubt God and to no longer serve him simply because we're going through a hard time. Joshua knows this enemy is against him. He's a good pastor of his flock. So would you look at me at what he does in Joshua chapter 4, then Joshua gathered, verse 1. He gathered, he's going to have a church service. Sunday morning is happening in Israel. He's gathering the entire flock, all the tribes of Israel, to Shechem and call for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers. They presented themselves, look carefully, before God. That's what happens when we come to church. You're not coming for me. You're not coming for the worship team. You're coming to present yourself before God so that you can hear what he's got to say. And Joshua said to all people, Thus says the, maybe you'll underline this, Lord God of Israel. Would you stop there? That's our first point. Thus says the Lord. The Lord. This word is going to appear 21 times in this chapter. You see, Joshua has come to an understanding after spending 60 years of ministry with God. Joshua has come to a place in his life where God is the Lord of his life. And so do you know what that makes Joshua? That makes Joshua a servant. For Joshua to say that God is Lord, what that means is that Joshua is a servant. And we're going to find that word in this chapter 15 times. Well, it makes sense. It makes sense that the word servant would follow the word Lord nearly as many times because if he truly is our Lord, then the very natural thing that you do to a master is serve him. And that's the message that Joshua is going to get across. It's God's message. It's not Joshua's message. And we've got to be careful as pastors. You've got to be careful in your study that you are studying God's word and not just your pet doctrines. That's how denominations get formed. That's how divisions happen in the church. That's why Paul said, and he he was thankful to say, I was faithful to teach you the whole counsel of God. God, not the thoughts of Paul. He spoke the word of God. It's why we at Calvary Chapel, we go book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. It prevents me from having a pet doctrine. So Joshua says, the word of God. And what we're going to find in this last sermon of Joshua, he's going to give God glory. He's not going to give himself glory at all. He's going to give all the credit, all the glory to God. See, Joshua's a pastor. He spent time with God. God is his master. The master has given Joshua a message. And this message, this message is going to have one point. Let me tell you something about a sermon. My sermon prep 
Oh, it starts, oh, several hours ago. In fact, to get a good message going for me, it's about 25 to 30 hours of my time. One message. Because it's not just about me teaching you. It's about the Word of God in my heart. You see, what you're hearing in a sermon is the point that God spoke to me. And in humility as a teacher, I'm expressing that point to you because I believe that's the message of God that he has for his body. And every message should have a point. And Joshua has a point. Would you go on with me in verse 2? Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in the old times, and they served other gods. There it is. There it is. He started with his Lord. He recognizes that he's a servant. And he's communicating that when we started out with God, we were serving other gods. And what the message that's going to begin to unfold, the point that Joshua is going to get across, is that if he's our master, then we are his servants. And we are to serve the Lord. In fact, I'm going to help you cheat Would you go with me to verse 14? I want you to see the point. It's Joshua chapter 24. Look at verse 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. He concludes the message. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Look at this. Underline it. Maybe you'll highlight it. Serve the Lord. There's the point. There's the message. Serve the Lord. See, Joshua's a good pastor. He knows his sheep. He knows them intricately. And he knows something is going on. They're not serving God wholeheartedly. Now, it's going to begin to unfold in a moment. You're going to see how he gets them to a place to confess what's going on. But he's going to purpose to encourage them with the word of God and to exhort them to get them to a place because he knows if they continue to compromise, this compromise is going to grow. We learned about it last week. You see, once you give birth to sin, it will grow until it's fully matured and brings birth to death. One compromise leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. Joshua knows that. He knows they're in compromise. And so would you take a look at verse 2 and 3 one more time. Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times. They served other gods. He's beginning to unfold it. Look at verse 3. All of a sudden, the pronouns change. Then I, speaking on behalf of God, took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. Stop there if you would. Point number two, maybe you'll write it down. The first thing that God wants them to know is how much he loves them. How much he has poured out his grace upon them. You see, we've got to remember, the Holy Spirit lets us know in 1 John chapter 3, that love is an action and a deed. It's truth and deed. It's an action attached to the truth that you know. And God, he chooses to act on their behalf. He chooses to pour out his love. He chooses to pour out his grace. Let me remind you, Terah was an idol worshiper and so was Abraham. And what God is reminding the children of Israel is this. I rescued Abraham from idol worship. I made you a nation. Your heredity doesn't go back to Abraham. Your heredity goes back to my grace in your life. I did this. You see, this word I in, the ne- in this sermon is going to be repeated 17 times. And what he's going to do is God is going to give the children of Israel a little dose of humility. He said, I rescued Abraham. Because Abraham, Abraham, your father of faith was not always the father of faith. He was an idol worshiper. 
And as far as God's concerned, idol worship is dumb. You remember when you got your new car and you washed it every three days? Do you remember when you vacuumed it like Every time you got out of the car, you even bought one of those little ones that you plug in in the wall and you can take in the car with you. And if someone put their foot on your, uh, uh, um, what do you call it? The, your foot thing. What do you call them? Your mat. Thank you. Hard word. Can't believe I'm a communicator. You would look at them like, I can't believe you put your dirty shoes on my floor mat. It's what it's there for. And as soon as they're out of the car, you remember. It got all your time. It got all your energy. It got everything. That it, in fact, it gets all your money. You pay for it every single month. You pay insurance. You pay gas. It says, feed me. I don't care it's $7. I help you get where you want to go. Feed me now. I mean, who wants to be stuck on the 405? Idol worship. Let me tell you something about that car. Do you know that it was made by human hands? Even though it speaks to you and tells you to put your seatbelt on, someone programmed that. And so God in Isaiah chapter 44, he says, let me tell you something about your idols. They're dumb. That's Chet version, but let me tell you what God says. Someone goes out into the forest, they chop a tree down, they make a wooden image, and then they bow down to it. The thing that they made, they bow down to it and say, speak to me. And it looks at them like, you're dumb for thinking I can talk. I mean, this is God's way of saying in Isaiah chapter 44, idols are... I want you to keep that in mind. I want you to keep that in mind. Because we've been rescued from those things. We've been rescued from worshiping man-made things. It was Paul's testimony, and Paul never forgot it. Paul always remembered, do you know where I came from? I can't believe that I used to worship the Jewish religion. And God sought me out. And God rescued me from my dumbness. And he brought me from darkness into light. Who has that as a testimony? Do you know the song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, that saved a... Like who? Uh Aha. We've been saved. We've been rescued. But I want you to take a look, if you would, at verse 4. To Isaac, I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau, I gave the mountains of Seir to possess. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Also, I sent Moses and Aaron. I plagued Egypt according to what I did among them. Afterward, I brought you out. Then Is God getting the point across? Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt. It wasn't Moses, it was me. You came to the sea. The Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. So they cried out to the Lord, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, brought the sea upon them, and covered them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. Then you dwelt in the wilderness a long time. And I... I brought you into the land of the Amorites who dwelt on the other side of the Jordan and they fought with you, but I gave them into your hand that you might possess their land and I destroyed them from before you. Not only have I made you, not only have I rescued you, but I have delivered you. I did that, not Moses. I was the one who was there guiding Moses in regards to what to do. And he says, listen, I've delivered you from two things. I delivered you from bondage. You were slaves in Egypt. I brought the plagues and I set you free from that slavery. And then to show you how glorious I was... I brought you to the Red Sea with the Egyptians behind you, the mountains on the side of you, and the Red Sea in front of you, and you all thought you were going to die. But then I told Moses, go out into the Red Sea with your stick. Put your stick in the water, and trust me, Moses, I'm going to blow the ground dry with an east wind through the night. Now imagine you're Moses. you got to go to your elders. 
hey guys, here's the deal. I just spoke with God and he told me we're not going to die. I know the Egyptians are right there. Don't worry about it. And there's no way for us to get over the mountain with these millions of people. I'm just going to go put my stick in the water. We're going to see what happens. Now, if you're one of the elders, you're looking at Moses going, you are nuts. But sure enough, Moses was obedient to God. He put his stick in the water and the Lord blew I can just, can you see the tornado coming up from, from the east? And that tornado just comes up and goes straight through the water. And as it's going through the water, it starts sucking up the water and pouring it out on each side. And the children of Israel are just watching and witnessing the mighty deliverance of God. Do you remember when you walked down the aisle for the first time and the Red Sea parted, the Holy Spirit fell upon you and you received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord and you were set free from your sin? Church, let me tell you something. If we ever forget that moment, God will remind us, I did that for you. But not only did I deliver you from Egypt. I want to see what else I delivered you from. Would you take a look with me at verse 9? Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose to make war against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam, therefore he continued to bless you. So I delivered you out of his hand. Then you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you. Also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. But I delivered them into your hand. I'm your deliverer. I've delivered you. You see, not only did I deliver you from Egyptian slavery, I delivered you from enemies, the enemy's spiritual attack. You see, when you get saved, I need to let you know something. The enemy hates your guts. That's why I never say, come to Jesus, you'll have a happy life. Because as soon as you walk out of here, the enemy puts a target on your forehead. You lose your job. You lose your this. You lose your that. I mean, it's like, whoa, what has happened to me? Someone got saved here just a few weeks ago, and they looked and came to me uh, just last week, and uh, the week before, and said, my life has been wrecked since I came to Jesus. And I said, praise the Lord. That means you're actually in the Lord. <laughs> he goes, what are you talking about? And I said, when you get saved, the enemy hates your guts. And you can never forget what God is telling the children of Israel. I delivered you from Balaam. Now, do you know in that story, we don't ever see God telling Balaam what to do. We just know that God won't let him curse him. And it's so important that you recognize that because oftentimes God is fighting a battle for us that we don't even see. You're a parent. How many of you have gone by your children's bedside while they're sleeping, laid hands on them, and fought spiritual battles? Lord, get rid of that girlfriend in Jesus' name. <laughs> Father, kick that boy to the curb. Lord, I pray against those friends that they would get the plagues that you gave Egypt. I mean, I, I've not necessarily prayed those exact prayers, but very similar. We had a girl in my son's life. She had a very biblical name. But she should have been named Jezebel. And when my wife and I prayed, the Lord spoke to us, embrace her. We were fighting a spiritual battle, and I said, Lord, you want us to embrace Jezebel? And he taught me a very powerful lesson, because this, as soon as I embraced her, instead of come against her, there was no longer a fight, and she was done, and she left him. Hallelujah. That's why it's always good to fight God's way. Even when you don't understand it, he's fighting for us, even when we can't see him. I remember in Liberia. We had four flat tires behind Rebel Lines. We were stuffing the tires with grass and dirt to get out of the Rebel territory. 
All of a sudden, this guy walks up to us in the middle of the night, takes a machete, swipes it on the ground, and comes up and holds the machete to my friend's throat. My friend says, who are you? And the guy goes, I'm greater than God. My friend got so mad. He looked at him. He said, this is my country. These are my people, and this is my land. I'm going to let you know you may kill me today, but you are not greater than God. You know what I was thinking? This ain't my country. (laughs) These are not my people. This is the first time I've been on this territory. I think a little diplomacy will work. So I reached down to get the tire iron that I was using, and this is the kind of diplomacy I was about to use. I reached down to get the tire iron that we're using to fix the tire, and I came up to hit the guy. When I came up, my head hit the hatch of our car. The trunk of our car knocked me straight out. I woke up, and it was dark and hot. I started to cry. Oh, my God, I've served you my whole life. Am I in hell? (laughs) And I looked at the guy that was with me, and I said, dude, are we dead? He goes, we're not dead. And then he said this. He goes, dude, I don't know what you were thinking, but while you were out, we got ambushed, and 16 guys attacked our car with machetes and guns. He goes, you slept through the whole thing. And he said, as quick as they attacked us, all of a sudden, terrified, they turned around and left. Let me tell you something. I can't wait to meet the angel that stood in our car and said, come near him. Touch, touch him. Let me see. Touch him. I want to see what happens to you. My mom says that my angel gets to retire when, it get to, when I get to heaven. You see, God's fighting a battle for us though we don't even know he's fighting the battle for us. And we as well need to fight battles for our family and our friends. We don't got to go walk up to them and say, I'm fighting a spiritual battle for you, son. They'll look at you and go, Dad, really? Like, what are you talking about? Just when they're sleeping, go in their room, lay your hands on your kids, and get that girlfriend out of there. Trust me, God will fight your battle. Now, some of you are going, I never thought about that. I can't wait to get home. Don't freak your kids out. When they wake up and you're like, and you're speaking in tongues in the whole nine yards, you got to be careful. But I also want you to see sometimes he fights in realms that we can see. He says, you went in to all the ites, the parasites, the gergashites, the jebusites. You went into all of them and I defeated them for you. You see, this is why we pray, deliver us from the evil one. The Bible says that God's a man of war. He wants to fight our spiritual battles. So when we pray, deliver us from the evil one, God rushes in and fights our battle. Because he is fighting for us, not against us. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Let me remind you of something. Do you know that only a third of heaven left to go follow Satan? We outnumber them three to one outside of the Holy Spirit who's on our side. So when you start going into all of your, like, the demon of the, the, demon of the closet and the demon of this, and we got to get the de- When the Bible says avoid evil of all kinds, we got to walk around with confidence. we got three angels on our back as compared to the one that left heaven. You are more than a conqueror. You're not just a conqueror. You are more than a conqueror. Trust God to fight your battle. Amen? Amen. Joshua chapter 24, take a look at verse 12. I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out. Wait, 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 what happened? I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you, also the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow. God said, I sent hornets. Can we just leave it there? Theologians try to explain Well, the army went in like a a band of hornets. Why can't God use hornets? I mean, he used water. 
to become ground and stepped on it. So why can't he use creation for his purposes? You see, God delivered them and he supernaturally blessed them. Yet the hornet's fighting for them. Take a look what else he does. Not only got hornets fighting for him, I've given you a land for which you didn't labor. Cities you didn't build. You didn't, and, you, you, and you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. He says, listen, I've supernaturally blessed you. I have fulfilled my promise to you that I gave to your servant, to my servant Moses. You're living in a house that you didn't build. I told you that you would. Why won't you realize how good I am to you? You see, with all of this, God's proven his love. Joshua is trying to show the children of Israel the kind of God that loves them. Do you know what John tells us? John tells us that we love God because he first loved us. So what I want you to do right now is look back on your own life. How has God shown you his love? Stop for a moment and just look backwards in order to look forwards. How has God poured out his love on you? You see, we love God because he first loved us. So our response is a response to his love. Will we choose to love him the way that he has loved us? This is our choice. And Joshua makes a choice. He has seen the love of God. And he says, Lord, you have shown your love to me. That's why in 60 years of ministry, you're my Lord. That's why in 60 years of ministry, I will choose to serve you because you're a good God. And as I've gone the way of the word, I have witnessed the miracles of your work. So Joshua says in verse 14, now therefore fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. You see, now, number three, it's up for you to make your choice. You see how good God is. God has detailed for you how intricately he's involved with your life. And now he's asking for you to make a response. With all that God has done, what will be your response? Well, throughout the course of this sermon, Joshua's been indicating to us servants of the Lord. I called Abraham out, he says. And the indication is, Abraham followed by faith. Abraham followed by faith. He says in verse 7, when the children of Israel cried out to me, when they prayed, I delivered. Another indication, not only do we need to take steps of faith, we need to be people of prayer in order to serve the Lord. And then the Bible says in verse 8 and verse 11 of the very same chapter, you fought, I delivered. There are going to be battles of faith. And if we're going to serve the Lord, you better believe there are going to be battles. And so what Joshua does he dictates, he encourages, he exhorts them now on how to serve the Lord. Would you look back at verse 14? Now, therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and truth. See, if you're going to serve the Lord, you've got to be real and you've got to be genuine. You see, these guys have secrets, and Joshua knows it. And we're going to find out they're secretly worshiping other gods in their tents. Shh, don't tell anybody. Because no one knows. Just put that little asterisk underneath the covers. Nobody will know. When we come in our tent, we'll just take it out, and then we'll go back out. Don't tell anybody about mammon. Don't tell him about the little bale that's there. 
You see, we've got this little secret. I know it looks a little awkward under the bed, and it's like this wooden thing that was like in our tent, but just take it out. We'll all bow down to it. Then we'll go out and we'll go to Joshua, okay? We're just going to live the double life. We're going to serve God in front of Joshua, but we're going to serve Baal when we're in our tent, in our little secret place. Do you know, according to the word of God, we are only to have three secrets. According to the word of God, we're only to have three secrets. You can find them in Matthew chapter 6. The first secret is how much you give. That's the first secret. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. The second secret is how much we pray. Go to your father in the secret place, he says. The third secret is when you fast. Spiritually, those are the only secrets we're to have. Do we have anything other invading our secret place? Maybe you call it skeletons in your closet. I'll tell you a story. My daughter was three years old. She loves chocolate. She is a true Chet Lowe child. I live and breathe off of chocolate. I could have it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I could have Cocoa Puffs in the morning. I could have like, I, I, never mind, because the next thing I'll know, I'll have a pile of Cocoa Puffs here, and you don't want me to be 450 pounds. It would be difficult for me to get up on the stage. So please, listen carefully. I love chocolate. And my daughter, Sayla, loves chocolate just like me. When she was three years old, you know when you have a party, you put little dishes of M&Ms everywhere? Well, we kept filling the M&Ms like every five seconds. Finally, a pastor friend of mine goes in our master bedroom because he needed to use the bathroom. So I said, hey, just use our, the one was occupied. So I go, oh, just go in our room. He goes in our room, and my daughter is behind our bed with a mountain of M&Ms. She is eating one after the other. And when he comes in, now she's behind the bed on the other side. She looks up like this and she goes, shh, get out of here and don't tell anybody. <laughs> Three years old. That's a chocolate lover. Let me tell you, I couldn't even discipline her. I was so proud of her. <laughs> shh, get out of here and don't tell anybody. It's amazing how one M&M becomes two and three in our secret place. And Joshua knows they've got some secrets. And so he's trying to communicate to them, listen, you've got to be real and genuine. You've got to serve the Lord with sincerity and truth. But take a look at verse 15. He says, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What he says to them is this. You may need to change your perspective about serving the Lord. You see, they had developed a mentality that serving the Lord was evil, but let me help you to def define what that word means. Serving the Lord is harmful. Serving the Lord is worse. Serving the Lord is afflicting. It's displeasing. It's hurtful. I mean, if I serve the Lord, he may send me to Africa. Someone told me today, <laughs> I was talking to one of our staff members, and I said, I want to assure you of one thing, and I'm giving you this promise. I will never ask you to go to Liberia. And she looked at me and she goes, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Listen, what is it that you find about serving the Lord that's afflictive? Like when I say, hey, we need 300 volunteers for VBS. Oh, gosh, those kids. <laughs> I would have migraines every single day. Serving the Lord is just such a challenge. What if I say I'd love you to be an usher <laughs> and deal with people, God's people, and smile? <laughs> Can't do it. What if I touched your pocketbook and I said, are you tithing? Whoa, a little too quiet. <laughs> well, I can't give 10%. You're not supposed to give 
You're supposed to give cheerfully whatever it is that God tells you to give. He may ask you for 90%. We say amen. Now, when we go home and get our paycheck, and he goes 90%. That's evil. That's exactly what they were doing. It's too hard to serve the Lord. I mean, when you serve Astrid, I mean, she's the goddess of pleasure. I mean, we feel good when we serve her. Come on, God, don't make it so hard. And we really love serving mammon because he's the God of money. And I just, I mean, the more money I have, the more I can do for God. Really? Or the more you can do for yourself. Well, come on. They were serving Baal. I mean, Baal was about smartness and intelligence. And I mean, the more knowledge I get, I mean, that's a the good Christian I am. No, 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 no. You, you've lost the point. If you've got the most amount of knowledge, you will look like Joshua after serving God and knowing God for 60 years. You will be the chief servant. But you've got to make the choice. Because Jesus says you can't serve two masters. You'll love one and hate the other. And Joshua says, I've made my choice. Me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Take a look at what happens with the people in verse 16. So the people answered, And said, far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us out of our our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went among all the people through whom we pleased. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites who dwell in the land. We also will serve the Lord for he is our God. It's so easy to be in church. And sing. We ain't got no trials. It's so easy to be in church and say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, one time I was doing a wedding and I forgot the Lord's Prayer. I was like, Our Father which art in heaven. (laughs) There's something about a debt and a debtor. Like, (laughs) I was just so lost. And I began to recognize, is this just a prayer that I pray or is it something that comes from my heart? It's so easy to dance for the Lord. It's so easy to raise our hands for the Lord when we're in church. And that's what's happening here. They're in church. They're pastors in front of them. And I love when I see you out in the streets, especially when you and your wife are arguing. Because I will watch it and walk up to you and then I'll go, hey, and you go, oh, Pastor Chet, oh, we were just talking about you. I go, no, you weren't. <laughs> church, listen, it's easy to be a Christian in church, isn't it? But when you go on the outside, here they're going, listen, we're going to serve the Lord. We agree. Yes and amen. Look what Joshua says. But Joshua knows what's going on. He says to the people, you can't serve the Lord. He's a holy God. In other words, he's the separated God. You can't serve him and another God. That's what he's trying to get across. He's a jealous God. Not of you. He's jealous for you. Can you just imagine if Andre came home and she goes, listen, I'm a really great, hot-looking Christian babe. And I just feel like you should share me with three other men. Excuse me? I'm sorry, Um, I don't believe in an open marriage. I don't know if you've noticed Hollywood, all of these open marriages, they end in divorce. Because a husband is jealous for his wife. He's not jealous of his wife. And Andre would never come home and say, hey, I want uh, 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 three other guys because I'm so great. It's not who she is. It's not even in her because she's jealous for me. She wouldn't want me to come and say, hey, listen, I've got three other gals and I'm just wondering, can we share? That's how ridiculous it is to say that we serve God and hold on to our idols. And So Joshua knows what's going on. You can't do this. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he calls them out. Then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he's done you good. And the people said, Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. They're still not willing to confess their sin. They've got their little asterisk in the tent. 
No, we're going to serve the Lord. Joshua, we're in church. We've got to tell you what you, we want you want to hear. So I need to let you know something about confession. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to do what? Forgive us. And if we confess our sin to man, to God, we're forgiven. But if we confess our sin to man, the Bible says, you shall be healed. Forgiveness comes from God when we confess. Healing comes when we confess it to man. It's complete forgiveness. So Joshua knows they're not telling the truth because he's a good pastor and shepherd. He says, so Joshua said to the people, you're a witness against yourselves that you've chosen the Lord for yourselves to serve. And they said, we are witnesses. They're still not willing to confess. Now, therefore, he said, okay, then put away the foreign gods which are among you. Incline your heart to the Lord. See, there's a point in a counseling session where someone's not getting where you just got to say, dude. And he just calls them out and he says, okay, since you say you're going to serve the Lord, I know something. Get rid of your foreign gods. And he catches them in their sin. And he gives a way for them to return. Incline your heart. You see, the problem is they wanted the Asherah poles. They wanted mammon money. They wanted the intellect of Baal. And he says, listen, you've got to change your heart. And that happens through repentance. The only way that you're going to get rid of those idols is that you incline or you turn your heart to God. And turning your heart to God involves repentance. And they respond. So the people say to Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Then Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a large stone, set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. He wrote it down. That's why we have the book of Joshua. It's Joshua's journal as a witness of how great and good God is. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness to us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke to us. It shall therefore be a witness to you, lest you deny your God. So Joshua let the people depart, each to his own, each to his own inheritance. Joshua says, listen, okay, you're a witness. And as proof of your witness, I'm putting this stone here, a memory stone. And I'm wondering tonight if some of you need to establish a memory stone. I'm getting rid of my idols, and I'm going to surrender and incline my heart to God through repentance. I'm tired of coming to church and raising my hand and going home and worshiping my little whatever it is. Something that's invaded my secret place. And now how we close this book, in Joshua chapter 24, verse 29, came to pass after these things that Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, look at his testimony, died being 110 years old. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance at Temna Serah, which is in the mountains of Ephraim on the north side of Mount Gash. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had known all the works of the Lord, which he'd done for Israel. Now, it's kind of odd that we end with Joshua's death, but not really because the Holy Spirit is the one writing this book. And I have a question for you. What do you want your legacy of service to be to the Lord? Do you know what Joshua's was? Look at his title. The servant of the Lord. I pray that's what, I told Andre, don't put my name on my epitaph. If you believe it, I just want you to put servant of the Lord. Don't put Chet Lowe. Because who's going to remember Chet Lowe five years after I'm dead? But when someone sees my epitaph, I want them to see servant of the Lord. If you really believe it, Andrea, that's what I want you to put there. Then he gives us another example. 
the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel had brought up, another servant of the Lord, who brought up out of Egypt, they buried at Shechem in the plot of ground which Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for 100 pieces of silver, which had become an inheritance of the children of Joseph. He gives another example of a servant. Because Joseph served the nation of Israel by saving them. He delivered them. God put him from slave to jailbird to the prince of Egypt, and he fulfilled what God wanted him to do by saving the very family that sold him into slavery. Do you know how difficult that was for Joseph? And he gives a third example. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, died. They buried him in a hill belonging to Phinehas, his son, which was given to him in the mountains of Ephraim, Eleazar. Let me tell you something about Eleazar. He was the high priest. And he was given a task in Numbers chapter 4, verse 6, at the very beginning of his ministry, you are responsible for the tabernacle. Let me tell you something about that tabernacle. Wherever Joshua went, that tabernacle was safe and secure because Eleazar was a servant. God told him what to do, and he did it. He gives three great examples. But before we close, I want you to go back to verse 31 with me. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua. That's an important statement. And all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua. That's another important statement. Who had known all the works of the Lord which he'd done for Israel. The generation that listened to the word got to witness the works. Let me tell you about the book of Judges. They didn't get rid of their compromise. Some of them kept their little idols in their tent. And their children did whatever what they thought was right in their own eyes. Because compromise grows. It never stays stagnant. So when you get to the end of your life, do you want to look back and look back with regret? Got all the money, got all the intellect, had all the pleasure. But will you be known as a servant of the Lord? Well, maybe it's time like Joshua that you make a choice. As for me and my house, will serve the Lord. And you want to listen to the word of God tonight so you can witness the miraculous works of God. You want the sermon of your life to be, look what God did because I listened to his word. So maybe you need to be like Joshua tonight. And you need to make that decision. Because this book ends with Joshua's death to remind us the only way that we can be a true servant is to die to ourself and allow Jesus to be our master and we his servant. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, how great is your word. And Lord, tonight, We realize that the children of Israel, they weren't being honest. They look great. Joshua was speaking to the leaders. It was the leaders that had little idols in their tent. It was the leaders that thought it was difficult to serve you. But Joshua had seen your miraculous works. He'd listened to your word. And he made a statement, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Because his commands are not burdensome. They're not afflicting. When I look back on my life, I'll realize, like Joshua did, you were doing everything for me. Thank you, God. In an attitude of prayer, would 
Joshua was trying to get the church, the nation of Israel, through the word to repent. But they wouldn't, and he had to call them out. The fruit of that was their heart really wasn't turned because they were caught. They didn't confess. But with confession comes freedom. So tonight, we got to just ask ourselves, listen, believer, what's in your secret place? What has invaded your giving and your praying and your fasting? Is it your bad attitude? Is it something that you're being convicted of right now? So as Gannon sings this song, Pastor Pat's going to join me here. Tonight's your night to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's time to get rid of that God. You can't hide him. You got to get rid of it. So we're praying for you. You'll hear us applause as you come forward. Tonight's your night to say, as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. come forward. We want to pray with you. Church, you be in prayer. Pastor Pat's here with me as the Spirit leads. Would you come forward and make that decision tonight? It's in my spirit that there's someone wrestling in their seat. You see, the nation of Israel, they gave way to idolatry again and again and again. So God says to them, look, this whole thing is, the idolatry thing is dumb in Ezekiel 14. And he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to answer you according to your idols. Let me tell you what idols do. They lie to you. They tell you, keep going. This isn't bad. You'll make money for God. And you know that's not the motive. It's okay. I know she's not a believer. And sleeping with her is okay. You love her. That's what idols do. They answer you according to what you want. If you're wrestling in your seat and believe in the lie, you're being deceived. So without any music, I'm just going to give you a moment. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Is there anyone else that says, I making that decision tonight. Church, we want to pray together with the one who's come. And I know it's going to be my words, but church, would you say it with me and repeat this prayer after me? Let it be your heart. Dear Jesus, Today, I am casting down my idols. And as for me, I will serve the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for beckoning me to be my, that you're my Lord and I'm your servant. In Jesus' name.